This is 15 Minutes of Freedom. I'm your host, Ryan Idell. Today's episode is DARE. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the content. In today's episode, I'm going to share with you what I believe to be the fallacy of every 80s born child's life. And that is drug abuse resistance education or that DARE program. Now, I know as I start this episode, if you're an 80s child or maybe even older, this is a polarizing topic. This whole, like I remember growing up and it couldn't have been third or fourth grade at the oldest. You know, there was that dare bear that came around that had the black shirt on with the right or red writing that literally said on it, drug abuse resistance education. There was this massive push back then. I mean, gosh, I would have been in third grade. I would have been eight years old. So potentially 1992 or so, 92, 93. There's this massive push. So I think maybe if I remember, and I could be off, it was either, I think it was Clinton that was in office during this time. There's this push to just eliminate drugs. And that we have to educate the youth on why drugs are so bad. Now, inherently, as I'm sitting here, I don't disagree that drugs are bad. Like, really in any capacity. But let's look, as time has progressed, let's look at how the world looks just as a snapshot right now, 2018. So granted, we're, we're zooming ahead now. It's crazy to say how old this now makes me, like to put these numbers together. But it's been 24 years since I remember that time. Maybe even longer, maybe even 26 years. But now, marijuana that would have been the devil's lettuce from back in 1992, the thing, you know, just stay away from pot, it's horrible, it's bad, don't smoke it. Like that was pounded into our heads as children. Like it's, it's, it's atrocious. Well, now it's legal to smoke marijuana in many states across the U.S. and all of Canada. Right? So just, just think about that shift in, in, I'll just say consciousness. We went in 24 years time period discussing with the youth that anything you could do in that realm was literally comparable to ending your life. You're going to end up in prison. You're a bad person. It's just atrocious. Don't do it. Stay off drugs. To now in California, you can literally walk into a store or Colorado. I'll pick Colorado. You can walk into a dispensary in Denver. I don't have to be a resident of Colorado. I can show them my identification, my, my driver's license or passport. And I can walk in and buy a cannabis-based product and take it and smoke it or eat it or chew it or drink it or whatever it would be. Now, in this, of course, there are multiple levels. Like there's, there's a medicinal level that has a higher purity or higher concentration of cannabis, cannabis that, of course, you do need a prescription for. All that really means is you can get more active product in a smaller container. Another way to say that would be if I wanted, I'm going to make up numbers because cannabis, cannabis is not my thing. But from owning a CBD company, I'm certainly familiar with it. So let's say I wanted 20 milligrams of THC to be active in my body. I could eat four gummy bears that all have five milligrams of THC that are completely legal for me to buy just by walking into any dispensary in Colorado. Or I could go through the headache of getting a, a medical card and buy one gummy bear that has 20 milligrams in it. Either way, I can consume 20 milligrams. I'm within my legal right. The thought of how that shift in, I'll say, consciousness or awareness or evolution has happened over the past 24 years is really fairly staggering to me. Now, of course, if we look at the opioid crisis, switching gears, something that's very, I'll say, near and dear to me from the loss of my best friend Miles in early March to literally the crisis that's blanketing the United States of what I feel like is prescription pain pills that are being distributed from major pharmaceutical companies looking to capitalize on market share and profitability. I'm certainly not against profitability or owning market share. I believe in a free market capital, capitalism-based society. But in that, you're driving this population of people that are coming in to get pain points fixed. You're giving them an opioid-based product, getting them hooked on it, and then giving them no path to come off of it. And no path to come off when people are re-immersed into, I'll say, the regular population. They're out of their hospital. Their shoulders have healed. Their, their disease is, quote-unquote, fixed. They've now got a new monkey on their back being, 
an opioid addiction. With there not being any protocol to come off of opioids, what happens to so many people in the United States is now seeking out on the secondary market, or as I would refer to the black market, an opioid-based product. If it's not a pain pill, a Percocet, a Vicodin, an insert your pain pill, at some point, by the sheer nature of how economics work, it has been shared with me that you can buy a heroin-based product for pennies on the dollar of what a pain pill cost on the black market. So then there becomes a shift to now using heroin. I can say that from my personal experience with Miles, that was his path. That is what happened to him. A dilated drip for, an, for a surgery that he had to have, that he was given no path off of, that he came out and was given a pain prescription, a pain pill prescription, that when that prescription ran out and he could no longer get it filled, he reverted to prescription pain pills on the black market and then from there to heroin. So again, if any of this part of this episode you don't agree with or you don't like, I understand. I don't like talking about it in some capacity. But this is my view on this. So I fully agree with the D.A.R.E. program, the Drug Abuse Resistance Education, as it per pertains to opioids. Things that have a habit and addictive forming behavior. What becomes more unique is I go down the path of, I'll really say, neuroplasticity and a deeper understanding of psychology. An understanding of how many case studies have truly been had about the medicinal effects of hallucinogens as it pertains to healing trauma on your brain. The data and statistics behind it are really phenomenal. When you look at the number of case studies that exist right now of even a base level drug like MDMA, basically ecstasy or molly, whatever the right street name would be for it, in the pure form MDMA is being used in clinical settings and is up for approval from the FDA to be used to treat post-traumatic stress syndrome. Like, think about that for a second. Go back 24 years and anything that I'm discussing was, you. I was made to feel like I was on a one-way bus ride to hell if I touched any of these drugs. And I get it. I get it as a young person why it's not healthy to know about these drugs. Kind of. And I'll get to that in a moment. But as we progress now, 24, 26 years later, and seeing how we have evolved as a species and are becoming open to the idea that some of these things that were so taboo actually have a benefit in daily life. I think right now in your life, right, where all the things that you could have been closed off to because of some story that was impressed upon you by someone else that you just assumed to be the truth, how many places are you closed off to something that could be greater based off of literally a story? Like a, a tribal methodology, much like the D.A.R.E. program. See, again, I'm not saying that, that children should be using drugs. What I personally believe in is an education-based system. When I say education-based, I believe a lot of the drug use from when I was in high school, and I was not one to use drugs in high school, I've shared that very openly, it was never interesting to me. But I believe so many people that did go down that route, it was because of how taboo it was. Like you weren't supposed to do it. So what do we do as we start to rebel and spread our wings as young men and women? Well, we try things we don't, we're not supposed to try. What's the first thing you do when you get your driver's license? At least most of us. You hop behind the wheel of the car, you get out on a country road where no one's around, you see the speed limit says 45 and you freaking floor it. You go as fast as you can to like, oh shit, I'm going 85, it's too fast and you slow down. And you do it because you feel finally in, like empowered, like you're able to spread those wings and, and try to push against the walls of the system and see what happens. I personally believe that a lot of the, the pushing back and forth as it pertains to drugs is based off of the taboo nature in which they're presented at a young age. When you start looking at all the research that goes on over and over and over again as it pertains to how your brain actually can fire in the presence of a hallucinogen and what it does to you. I use this example quite often with my clients. Imagine your brain is, is of course, pliable. It's squishy even. 
And let's say your brain was so soft that you could have little bike trails that like run on your brain. I know this is a little obscure, so work with me here, if you will, just for a moment. And when you have a traumatic event in a young age, it's like running this bike over your brain and it, it's soft. And so you get these little grooves in your brain created by this little tiny bicycle. That's a pathway that gets created based off a traumatic event that any time in the future where a comparable traumatic event exists, your brain is wired for efficiency. So it takes that traumatic event and it routes it to that channel and you instantly go back down that same feedback loop up and down that channel. What it's been proven to do, what hallucinogens in clinical settings have been proven to do now are help smooth over those pathways. So in smoothing over those pathways, what could that mean to you? It would mean that the trauma and the pain and the stress that you've carried around for years, you might not fully be capable of understanding why or how it exists, could potentially, just potentially, be eradicated with the use of a clinical setting, microdose based hallucinogen product. Think of the impact that could be had on society if depression decreased. Think the impact that could be had on society if the divorce rate dropped based off of people getting along and being able to communicate. Think of what would happen, this is maybe a pro and a con, regretfully, for overpopulation, but think of what could happen if the suicide rate dropped based off people not being so depressed. Think of the trickle-down effect that happens for the kids and the families associated with those people specifically. Like, there's such a massive opportunity here for expansion and growth, but if you're not open to it because you've been told stories from your family, like my wife is a perfect example. We had a conversation last night based around acid, acid being essentially LSD. And she shares this wonderful story about her, how her grandfather drove from, gosh, somewhere in Ohio, I'm drawing a blank right now, but drove from somewhere in Ohio to her house as a young lady, third or fourth grade, and sat down with her and discussed with her not to lick stamps that she didn't know where they came from and not to use stickers and not to do all these things. If you don't know, there was a time period in life where there was this almost crisis that was either created or did potentially truly exist in which the main stage mass media was so worried about an LSD outbreak and that kids were getting high because adults were handing them stickers with, that were laced with LSD. And he basically insulted her over and over again that LSD, if you do it, you're, you're, you're just, it's literally a one-way ticket to hell. Like, don't do it. It's the worst thing ever. And so as we're having this conversation about the potential clinical dosing, and for me, where I sit, I'll just openly admit it, I'm considering what the pharmaceutical benefits could be or what the psychological benefits could be in a controlled environment of microdosing in very small increments LSD. I want to know the, the, the pros and cons. I want to know the facts of the situations. Not the feelings that people have, but the true facts. See, in situations like this, the feelings that come around with it are what obscures your vision of what could be possible. If the facts support the support the story that by taking incrementally small dosage in a clinical setting, by having somebody administer it that knew what they were doing, could I heal my brain and make it fire more rapidly so that I could be more pliable as a human being and be a better father to my daughter and a better husband to my wife? Why would I not want to do that? It's preposterous, right? Like, who wouldn't want that? And potentially that's too much of an extreme example for you. So let's go back to the marijuana side of things. Let's go back to weed. Now, there's a story that weed is just horrible. You do it. You're just a pothead. You're a stoner. You're, you're never getting anything done. It's just not possible. I am certain for some people that's probably true. But what about the subset of people that have cancer? And cancer cells are present in their body. And they have been smoking or using a cannabis slash THC slash CBD based product and have endless trials that show that the cancer cells are decreasing in size and volume. If you yourself had cancer 
And by consuming a marijuana-based product, you could rapidly increase your body's ability to fight off the cancer cells. Would you do it or would you go take radiation and chemotherapy based off the fact that that's what society tells you is more healthy? Even though, as you really think about it and do the research, that chemotherapy and radiation destroy your body's ability to fight off other attacks. Chemotherapy and radiation literally attack every part of your body. It's like a scorched earth principle. And you're preying on the fact that if you're staying in the hospital and you're supported, that you can prop up your body's defense systems just enough that those two, those two systems, those two processes together can fight off and destroy the cancer while your body's just barely able to limp along and then hopefully you'll be able to rebuild. But we as a society, at least an 80s baby, we look at that as like, sure, chemo and radiation is awesome. You're a pothead and a loser if you smoke pot. I like, think of that stigma. Right, like think of all the stigmas that are currently existing in your life based off a story that someone else told you that you never took the time to do the research for yourself and challenge it. And what becomes even more difficult is right now how the main stage media dictates what goes out there. Like it's not enough to hop on Google once or twice or hop on Facebook and type in, you know, marijuana medical benefits. That simple broad brush of research is not going to be enough to get you to the root answer that you might be seeking. Why is that? In my opinion, it's because the media is controlled by people that are in power and the people that are in power are the people that have money and the people that have money want more money. I get it. I have a certain amount of power. I have a certain amount of money. I want more of both. I don't think these people are bad. But it's almost their job on their side to make sure to disseminate information that props up their value system. I mean, really think about it for just a second. I know this is obscure, and you might be shaking your head like right now, like, what is Ryan even talking about? Think of what happens to the economy. Think of what happens to big pharma. If all of a sudden it's proven that plant-based medicines can solve many issues that we have. What if it's proven that marijuana When administered, I'll say again, in a clinical setting, you're just not sitting around your house smoking pot all day long. That There's double-blind trials done and, and proven research that then gets disseminated to the masses that show that marijuana or THC coupled with CBD can fight off cancer. What happens to all the hospitals? What happens to all the big pharmaceutical companies? Now, granted, as I think more worldly, there's also then an overpopulation issue that happens if cancer becomes eradicated. Like we run out of resources as, as, a, as a populace globally much, much more quickly if we're not losing hundreds of thousands of people a day to cancer. So it's a double-edged sword, right? We can't just solve for everything. But think about the same thing as, as it pertains to, to opi- or not to opioids, rather, but to psychedelics. What happens if all the PTSD... And all the relational you know, banter back and forth that you don't feel like you can be open... What if all that can somewhat be eradicated with the use of, we'll say, mushrooms, psilocybin? What if the fact of using psilocybin in a clinical setting, once again, opens up a new pathway and a new way for your brain to fire that actually is proven to be healthy? What if it's not so bad? What if it's not just the, 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 the videos that we see from the 60s of these people out in you know, Woodstock with their hands flowing around the air completely out of their mind? What if the terms around getting high, what if it wasn't, wasn't called getting high any longer? How would you view it if smoking weed meant getting healthy? How do you view it instead of tripping on mushrooms if you were connected with mushrooms? Like it's all the framing, right? It's all the setup. It's all what the, the version of the story that gets told to you ends up shaping your reality. And in this episode, this, this dare-based episode, that drug abuse resistance education that was pounded in my head as a young child, as a young man, it's nothing more than I'm encouraging you to question what really goes on. That simply digesting what the world says is right or wrong is almost a pathway to maybe long-term despair. 
And I get it. There's, there's, there's two different ways to view that. Like if your eyes aren't open, then you'll never see how bright the sun is. I understand that. Some of you listening right now, maybe you yourself, like, what is this? Like, I just, I'm happy with my life. This guy's crazy. It's con- conspiracy theory. Awesome. This, this shows just this episode maybe isn't for you at this moment. But some of you listening are thinking like, man, I, I haven't really ever done any actual research on my own for a few hours at a time figuring out if pot is actually bad or good. I certainly haven't done any, done any research on LSD or mushrooms or DMT, ayahuasca. I haven't done the research to see if those are good or bad. I've just been told they're bad, so I assume they're bad. I mean, that this is going to sound preposterous, but what happens if your parents said that all black people are bad? And the group that you ran around with and the society that you were part of also told you that all black people were bad. Or if you are in a predominantly black neighborhood, what if they told you that all white people are bad? What would happen if you never challenged that and found out for yourself and did the research? And maybe your research isn't based off going and hanging out with a bunch of black people. Maybe it's not based off pulling up some internet articles. Maybe you're just tiptoeing into it to see for yourself. What happens if you just never challenged what was presented to you? And that's the ultimate question is where in your life could you be challenging something to provide a better outcome for yourself? You know, could you be challenging the societal norms as it pertains to your body? Not from a hallucinogen hallucinogen base, not from a marijuana base, but from even the way you fuel your body. Like right now, I'm recalibrating, trying to figure out if a more vegan lifestyle is for me than a meat-based diet. I'm trying to see if I feel differently with it. There's so much, so many people in the world that claim to feel better when they stop eating meat. Well, I don't have to read a white paper. I don't have to go to some sort of clinical study to see if that's true. I can simply choose to not eat meat for a couple of weeks and see how I feel. What about yourself? Instead of fighting back and forth if veganism is good or bad, why don't you try it for a little bit? What do you have to lose? A couple pounds, maybe? You're going to lose the flavor of meat in your mouth for a couple weeks? I'm going to challenge, like, is that really serving you? Do you know yes or no? Same thing as it pertains to your relationship. Like, what's the story that's been passed down to you that you're not sure if you should challenge or not? Inevitably, there is one. Maybe it's the fact that once something goes bad, you can never fix it, that leopards don't change their spots. And that's just what you've been told for so long, so it has to be true. Well, I'll tell you from where I sit, if that's true... I'm screwed. If you look back at my track record in my 20s, I certainly am nowhere near the person I was then. So when in your life could that story be literally crippling you from the growth you're capable of? And what about business? Like what about the fact of the story that you have to go to college and then you have to now really get a master's degree and if you don't get a master's, well, you know, once you get a master's, maybe you gotta go get a PhD just to compete in the job market. Because that's what's been told to you by your parents. That's what's been told to you by society. And that's what you assume to be true. Instead of taking the time and energy to do the research on what that really means financially and how competitive the job market is and how much different could your life be if you started following your passion instead of what people around you told you you had to do. How much more fulfilled would your life be? And what does success mean? Does it mean debt and money or does it mean fulfillment and happiness? Only you get to decide that. And what I'll say is when you begin to live your life in a way that you challenge what is presented to you, not out of spite, but out of general curiosity, and then you create your own base level for what you believe to be proper or improper to live your own life, you'll find out that every day you're able to get shit done.